But what we've seen is there's been an evolution from what people are doing as the technology has developed, as the usage of the tokens and the blockchain itself has developed. So too in more traditional systems. So we've had large organizations saying, blockchain, pff, who cares? It's not going to make a difference. To actually, it is quite interesting. Let's experiment with it. Let's run a teeny tiny project. We'll, we'll call it a proof of concept because it sounds good and we'll get, send out all these media releases. And there's all this fanfare and they get all front page news of coin, Coindesk and all the rest of it. And then it goes quiet. Because there wasn't really much behind it. Or it goes quiet because there was and they went, okay, we've run this teeny tiny POC. We think it may have an application. Let's actually test that and let's work out whether it actually works. That is Hannah Glass and this is episode 5 of the Blockchain Pro podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the Blockchain Pro podcast. I'm your host, Adriana Bellotti, and our guest today is one of my dearest friends, Hannah Glass. Hannah is a smart lawyer who began her crypto journey learning about Bitcoin and early multi-sig and smart contracts. She works for one of the major law firms in Sydney and is also a prolific and terrific conference speaker. We got together at my place a few weeks ago and here's our conversation. Okay, hi. All right. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> Hello, how are you? I'm all right, how are you? I'm pretty good. <laughs> it's good to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. I mean, your story is very interesting, so I think we should dive right into it. Okay, my story, basically how I fell down the rabbit hole of blockchain. Absolutely. So I first got involved because I had a bit of downtime at work. So at the time, I was still a baby lawyer, and I was just looking at areas of the law where it didn't quite work with what was going on in the world around me. And in particular, I was actually looking at crowdfunding and the problems of equity crowdfunding. And through that, I started speaking to other lawyers who were also looking at what was wrong with the law. Not that it didn't was wrong per se, but it just didn't quite work in the way that it needed to. Okay. And I came across a lawyer who was looking at Bitcoin. And she was working with a few people in the industry and she said, we've got a problem at the moment because we don't know where Bitcoin fits. And there's a whole question, is it money? Is it some sort of financial product? How do we deal with it from a tax perspective, from a licensing perspective, from anti-money laundering? And because my area of the law traditionally is financial services and financial products, I started saying, well, why don't I speak to you and let's have a think about how this actually works and how it fits or does it fit with the existing categories? And so we started working through what's Bitcoin, what are the features of it, what do you get when you hold it, how do you transfer it, how do you hold it, mm -hmm. and looked at Bitcoin and mapped it against all the traditional legal categories that are regulated and eventually came to the conclusion of, oh, well, Bitcoin itself doesn't fit into any of these. It looks much more like a commodity, which was pretty exciting because it meant that, well, it's, it's not regulated. And because it's not money, because it doesn't have the same features as money, it's something completely different, which was actually quite amazing. What features of money are these? <laughs> <laughs> so fungible, yeah. um, meaning one is treated the same as another. So one $5 note, same as another $5 note. Um, it is widely accepted. So you can use it to pay for your coffee in any cafe around Sydney or indeed a, ca a cafe in anywhere else around Australia. Mm -hmm. um, they are interchangeable and they're portable. The thing about Bitcoin though is whilst it is fungible, as in one Bitcoin is worth the same as another Bitcoin, and whilst it is accepted in a fair few places, it's difficult to go into any cafe in Sydney with just your Bitcoin and use that to buy your coffee. You need a phone or... It's not that you necessarily need a phone, it's that 
for instance, you need a debit card that has access to your wallet and eff effectively converts your Bitcoin into normal currency. And then what you're doing is from the merchant's perspective, you're buying it with normal currency, even though there's this intermediary that sits in the middle and actually converts your Bitcoin for you. Which is more or less like walking into a cafe in the United States and paying with your debit card from an Australian bank. To some extent. Okay. But even when you do that, what you're dealing, doing is you're paying with what's called a non-cash payment facility. So you're paying with a product, a financial product. Mm -hmm. It's not the cash. Yep. It's actually the facility that you use. So to here, it's the facility that is the mechanism of payment. Okay. Um, and that was actually what we did with Bitcoin is we tried to work out, well, is it the Bitcoin that you're paying with that's the facility for payment? Or is it, in fact, the other thing itself? Is it that mechanism? Is it that debit card? And we came out to the conclusion of, yes, it's probably that mechanism of payment, that non-cash payment facility. And that's the regulated thing, not the Bitcoin itself. Okay. Um, which actually had huge ramifications because the reason why we were going through all of this was because at the time the ATO, mm -hmm. the Australian Taxation Office, was looking at how they should treat digital currencies mm -hmm. and in particular how it should be treated for goods and services tax or um, value-added tax in the UK or so, and that sort of thing. And they came out with the view that it was a commodity, which meant that every time you bought it, you had to pay tax. And every time you use it to pay for something else, you also had to pay tax. So effectively, you paid the same 10% twice. Mm. That was a problem. A little bit of a problem, yeah. <laughs> um, but we've changed the law now. Yes. That changed last year, which is pretty exciting, actually. So what part did the... I wouldn't want to say the lawyer community, because <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it wouldn't be everybody, but... Um, what part did you play, for example, in changing that law? What part did I play? Um, so initially it was just those conversations as to working out what the thing was. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there working out, okay, well, if we see it as a commodity, that means that from a goods and services tax perspective, well, yes, you probably should be paying that 10%. But then saying, okay, well, that's what the law is. The next question is, what should it be? Mm -hmm. How are people actually using this? Why do they use it? And clearly it makes sense that if you are using Bitcoin to pay for your coffee, then you shouldn't have to pay the same 10% tax. Mm -hmm. So it was a matter of going back and working out, okay, well, there's obviously something that doesn't fit. Where in the law is it that it doesn't fit? Is it something which can just be changed by some sort of guidance that's published by a regulator? Mm -hmm. Is it something that's actually hardwired into the legislation itself, which means that we need to literally go to parliament? Is it something where we need to possibly go to the courts and get the courts to reinterpret something that a regulator has said? So it was a matter of saying, what is it? How do we change it? And then the third bit, and this is where it became really interesting, is what do we want to change it to? Ah, oh, okay. Because you can say, okay, well, it doesn't make sense. But then the question is, well, why doesn't it make sense? And what do we need it to do going forward? And what's really interesting, particularly about the GST changes, is that there's a new definition that was created of digital currency. And the definition of digital currency does not refer to Bitcoin, it doesn't refer to ETH or XRP or any particular cryptocurrency. It doesn't refer to cryptographic um, technology and it doesn't refer to blockchain technology. What it actually looks at are the features of a digital currency. Okay. And so it's basically something that is effectively like money but is not backed by or related to a government. So it also means that in the future, if we do have a central bank issue digital currency, that will be treated like money and not digital currency. Mm -hmm. And it also only can be treated that way when it is used in that way. And what that, what that means is if you're buying, let's say, Bitcoin, because easy, and you're holding it in your wallet, and you're holding it there because you think that the value is going to go up, and you don't use it to pay for your coffee, and you don't use it for any other purpose, you still need to be able to pay other tax on that. Mm -hmm. So we can't say, okay, well, Bitcoin's money, because it isn't money. It has some of the features of it, but it should only be treated like money when it's used like money. And so the definition of digital currency that's now in the Act is designed to facilitate that. Okay. So if you buy Bitcoin, for example, and you just hold it because the value goes up, Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes it goes down. That would be treated differently than 
Bitcoin that's in your wallet for the purpose of buying your dinner? The Bitcoin itself isn't, but the tax is. The okay. tax that you pay on it is. Um, part of that's also because there are different acts. So people think that, okay, we've created a definition of digital currency. Now that exists across all laws everywhere, mm -hmm. or at least all laws in Australia. And it's not the case. It's, that is a definition that sits within the GST Act, or the a new tax system, whatever. Basically, it sits within that particular act. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sit in any other taxation act. So anything that relates to capital gains tax, so that's the tax that you'll pay if you bought Bitcoin at, $500 of Bitcoin and sold it at $8,000 of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. you pay tax on the increase in value. Mm -hmm. It doesn't apply for income tax, so if you're actually earning in Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and it doesn't, uh, and then also the other thing is it means that when you're, say, running a business using Bitcoin and you have losses on that business, mm -hmm. then that also gets treated in that same tax pool. Okay. So again, that's treated as an asset in those situations, whereas for GST, it's treated differently. Okay. Now, bearing in mind, I'm not a tax expert. Yep. My background is much more in those sort of financial services and, the, and a bit of anti-money laundering. But it's the same idea, which is that when you have this asset, it's new, it's different. You work out how it fits within the existing system. And if it doesn't fit within the existing system, what are the minor tweaks, what are the small things that we can do to make it fit in the way that functionally works best? And it's that function that's really important. So the, one of the other things that got me interested was actually anti-money laundering. Okay. Yeah, because of course, back in the early days, mm -hmm. Bitcoin was associated with the Silk Road and drug trafficking and people trafficking and all sorts of other things which are quite frankly illegal and should remain illegal. Absolutely. But it doesn't mean that Bitcoin is illegal or Bitcoin should be illegal. Oh, the same way that those things existed before Bitcoin, people were trapped, the drugs were trafficked, and illegal things always existed as long as there's people that want to do those illegal things, right? Unfortunately. So it's, it's not Bitcoin's fault or the cash system fault or money's fault, it's people's fault. Yeah, oh, completely. It's, unfortunately, there are people out there who will do the wrong thing regardless. And we try and do everything that we can to stop that. Um, and one of the ways we do that, and the whole purpose of anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing legislation and the international rules that govern that or influence it, is that we can prevent it or we can at least find where these things are going and how this, these illegal activities are being funded. Because if you can't fund something, then it's very difficult to actually execute it. Absolutely. So... The same way that we don't say cash is illegal because it can be used to, say, buy and sell drugs. Mm -hmm. We just say we monitor the use of cash where we can. Mm -hmm. So to were we trying to work out exactly how digital currencies and Bitcoin and, or the, other, and the other sort of assets in that class should be treated for anti-money laundering purposes. And what's really interesting there is you're only regulated if you fall within one of these services. It's called a designated service under our act. So, for instance, if you are a bank and if someone's taking money out of an ATM, then the amount of money that's taken out is monitored. And, of course, once you've taken out the cash, you don't know where that cash is going, but you can certainly monitor the fact that someone has suddenly gone from taking out $100 in cash sort of a couple of times a week to taking out $1,000 in cash every single day for two weeks. Now, that's a very different pattern of behavior. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, if that sort of thing starts to happen, it's highly likely that the bank will say, that's suspicious. We need to report that because they have an obligation to do so. It doesn't mean that they have to report it every time you take out the $100. And it also doesn't mean to say that if you are starting to take out $1,000, that that's illegal either. It could just be that there's a particular thing that you're doing and you need to have cash for it, whether that's because you've got a new business and that business is a cafe and you need cash for the cafe. Or you cut up your credit card and you're just spending cash now. Exactly, because you've decided that that's it. I'm sick and tired of credit card debt. I'm running a cash. I'm, run, I'm using cash because I can see it. It's tangible. Yeah. It's not illegal. No. Same, but the bank monitors that. Mm -hmm. And or, banks internationally monitor that sort of activity and that's completely fine. You monitor the on-ramps and the off-ramps into the regulated system. 
the problem with or the problem that was perceived with Bitcoin and crypto assets is we weren't monitoring those on ramps and off ramps. We didn't know what was going on. And we weren't monitoring when someone was, say, using their credit card to buy Bitcoin. We couldn't see what was going on. Mm -hmm. So what we've now got is a new category in the law here, which is also a digital currency, but a slightly different definition of a digital currency. And the definition's different to the definition in the GST purposes because it fits within the law itself. And what it means is now if you're a digital currency exchange operator, mm -hmm you need to register with our regulator in Australia called Austrac. The whole purpose of that is if you are exchanging money for digital currency or digital currency for money, it's those on-ramps and off-ramps that get monitored. And it means the transactions are monitored. If it's something which looks like it's normal, well, there's no problem. If it's something that suddenly looks suspicious because there's a change in the pattern of your behavior, now that's something which is a red flag and that red flag gets reported. Again, it doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong or that the exchange has done anything wrong. It just means that we're able to look at what we think makes sense and what we think doesn't. So we can assess if there's a problem. And if we think there is, and we think, say, that money's being funneled to Syria, well, then that is a problem. We want to know that that's going on. Mm -hmm. It's not the Bitcoin or the cash that's at fault. It's the person behind it. So basically, if you're doing something wrong, you're doing something wrong. But we need to have a system in the law that's able to accommodate that. And that's sort of what I've been doing is looking at where there are gaps, okay. assessing where they are, making sure that the gaps don't result in someone saying, okay, well, let's just ban Bitcoin. Because we're not going to ban cash, so why would we ban Bitcoin? It's how do we do this in a way that works and it still allows the system to run? So... Um for the people who are just coming out of university, for yep. the new lawyers that <laughs> they're graduating this year, um, yep. what what type of things should they look if they wanna if they want to get into this? Exactly. Ooh, good question. So, as I was saying, I came into this as a very traditional lawyer, mm -hmm. looking at regulatory practices. The other thing that really got me interested was not just gaps in the law; it was also contracts and the concept of a smart contract and assessing whether a smart contract from a tech perspective is actually a contract from a legal perspective. And when we were looking at that, the same way that when we looked at these acts, we went down to the fundamentals. What is it? How is it used? What are the rights? So too, looking at smart contracts, we went back to what is a contract? Offer, acceptance, consideration, meeting of the minds. Can you actually understand the thing that you're agreeing to? Is there some sort of acceptance? How have you accepted it? Basically, in both examples, what we're actually looking at is what are the fundamental legal principles that underpin the law? Not what's the letter that's written in an act, but why is it that way? Mm -hmm. So actually understanding the fundamentals of the law is really important. Do you think lawyers should learn programming? <laughs> I think you need to understand okay. programming. I don't think you necessarily need to know the language of a particular code. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to know the logic behind it. Mm -hmm. So what that is, is if you understand why programs are written in the way that they are, mm -hmm. then you understand why it is, or a, say for instance, a smart contract is or isn't a contract. And you can work with developers to make sure that a smart contract, or at least a smart legal contract, operates effectively, both in tech and at law. I think... If you can code, it's, it's, an, it's an incredible asset to have. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that people should know their strengths. And the same way that I said before, I'm not a tax expert. And when we're looking at change to the tax law, I go and I speak to the tax experts in the mm -hmm. firm that I'm at mm -hmm. because they're the ones that know it inside and out. And quite frankly, you don't want my advice on tax. You want theirs. Mm -hmm. Same way when you're coding. Mm -hmm. You don't want the lawyer to be coding. You want the person who's an expert in that particular coded language. They're the ones who should be doing it. Mm -hmm. They need to understand each other and speak to one another. But you want the expert. You want the best person for each part of the job. And how do you see all of this new technology that is sort of like starting to introduce itself into law? Mm. 
uh, what is the presence that they have in the legal system right now? For example, do judges know about it? How, 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 how are they getting training? Uh, <laughs> do they need to get trained? Uh, have we had any cases brought to court that were about this that you are aware of, of course, that, you know, a judge need to consult an expert as yourself, for example? So it's interesting. I mean, you still have judges who don't use email but they're still incredibly effective judges and some of them even preside over cases which relate to technology. Mm -hmm. The fact that a judge doesn't use email doesn't mean they're able to understand the fundamental legal principles. Yes, you just don't like that particular part of the process. For exactly. Example. It's a tool, email is a tool. Exactly, and a lot of the time so is this. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's another tool you, and you go back to, well, What's the traditional system? Mm -hmm. How does it work there? What are the similarities and differences? And how do you assess this again? I mean, we've had cases before courts looking at different patents. And you need engineers to come in and explain how the patent works. And this is, I'm not talking blockchain patents, I'm mm -hmm. talking complex things to do with, let's say, mobile phones. Mm -hmm. And then a judge needs to seek the appropriate information, or at least they need to have the parties to the case bring that appropriate information to the court so that the judge has enough information at their fingertips to preside over that case and to make a ruling. Mm -hmm. Same thing here. The parties need to make sure that the judge has enough information at their fingertips so they understand the evidence that's being produced. Mm -hmm. So if you just say to a judge, and this is what we found really interesting, if you say to a judge, well, it was a smart contract, Your Honour. I say, well, what's a smart contract? Well, it was a smart contract. If you say the word contract to a lawyer, they think offer acceptance consideration. They think not necessarily a legal document, but certainly an agreement. If you say a smart contract to someone who's a dev, they don't necessarily mean an agreement. They mean a particular piece of that programming code that does a certain thing. Now, they're very different terminology, and they have de very different results. But you need to make sure that when you walk into court, you know that the word contract in tech language is not the same as the word contract in legal language. And if you don't educate the judges to the difference between the two, well, then they're just going to come at it from their own perspective. I mean, we're seeing in the US at the moment that various different government bodies, the SEC, Attorney General's Office in New York, are issuing subpoenas, whether that be to people who have run ICOs, whether that be to the exchanges there. And they're doing that because they want to know what's going on. And they also can see that when you look at what people are doing with this new tech through that traditional legal framework, that there's something there that's not right. In the ICO example, you have people who are selling assets, which are effectively, in the US example, securities, mm -hmm. with the Dow, for instance. Mm -hmm. And it's an illegal offering of securities. Now, if you suddenly offer shares, and you don't comply with the legal requirements, then you have a problem. So too, if you're offering any other sort of asset which looks and feels like a share, mm -hmm. just because you've got a crypto element to it or a blockchain element to it doesn't mean that you're outside of that. We do have a responsibility, however, to make sure that people understand the similarities and the differences so that we don't get to a stage where someone goes to court and says, oh, but your honor, it was a smart contract. And the, the judge goes, well, there's no meeting of minds here. I don't understand what the agreement was. And the dev goes, oh, but there was no agreement. It's a smart contract. And then you end up with a circular example going round and round and round. <laughs> oh, that, okay, so what type, of, what type of clients in the blockchain crypto industry look for lawyers? So what kind of advice they get from you, for example? What kind of advice? Um, there are sort of a few different types of clients that we work for. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this change over time from when it was literally just people who were dabbling in Bitcoin and the first smart contracts like the escrow arrangements and multi-signatory arrangements were coming out. That's when I first got involved. And to be honest, most lawyers who I spoke to thought I was mad. <laughs> They're like, well, what on earth are you talking about this smart contract? Like, we've got a contract here and it's 300 pages. That's the contract that matters. And I go, no, 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 but there's this smart contract and it's really, really cool and it can change the way we run escrow arrangements. And they're like, yeah, no. <laughs> we use banks and we use trust companies and we use large institutions and pieces of paper. Or pieces of paper that have been scanned into PDF form. Mm -hmm. 
over time it's changed and I certainly see a lot of people around me looking at, well, can we use blockchain for this? Does it work? Is there an application? So we've gone from startups and enthusiasts, really crypto enthusiasts, through to larger organizations and some of them very large organizations. I'm talking ASX 200 companies. Mm -hmm. And of course, governments looking into what's going on with the technology and is this something that can be used? What's really interesting actually is to see that development because it's not just startups, it's also what are you using it for? It's We've gone with the startup from, well, let's write a smart contract to let's run an, a crypto fund, let's operate an exchange to let's do an ICO, to let's build a blockchain project, but we want to write an ICO because we want money. <laughs> when setting aside ICOs, we're not going to go into that. That's another discussion. Absolutely. That's a long, long discussion. <laughs> yep, it is. But what we've seen is there's been an evolution from what people are doing as the technology has developed, as the usage of the tokens and the blockchain itself has developed. So too in more traditional systems. So we've had large organizations saying, blockchain, pff, who cares? It's not going to make a difference. To actually, it is quite interesting. Let's experiment with it. Let's run a teeny tiny project. We'll, we'll call it a proof of concept because it sounds good and we'll get, send out all these media releases. And there's all this fanfare and they get all front page news <laughs> of coin, Coindesk and all the rest of it. And then it goes quiet because there wasn't really much behind it. Or it goes quiet because there was and they went, okay, we've run this teeny tiny POC. We think it may have an application. Let's actually test that and let's work out whether it actually works. And those are the really cool projects. But what's fascinating is what started as we're doing this because someone likes blockchain and we can get funding to do blockchain. And this is happening with startups too. I know people who've gone out and raised capital, significant amounts of capital, because they said we're using blockchain. And then a year later, they've realized that blockchain is not the most effective technology to use. But there may be something else that is. Maybe it is a matter of that. It's just that encryption that attracted them to blockchain, which is what's most relevant to solving the problem they're trying to solve. So the beauty of it is actually we've gone from we want to use blockchain to we want to use, we want to create a solution for a particular problem. And we want to create a solution that works. And blockchain is one of the potential things that we could use. But there are other technologies out there and there are other things that we should look at too. And ultimately, if it means that people are re reassessing how they do things and trying to find a better way of operating, mm -hmm. whether it's blockchain or whether it's AI or using big data analytics, it's got to be better than shuffling pieces of paper. If you can be more efficient, why not, right? Exactly. And, okay, so... What sort of advice would you give to someone, a lawyer, either an experienced lawyer or a fresh lawyer that wanted to explore this area? Is there any resources or anything that you look to constantly? What, wh how do you learn? <laughs> how do I learn? Um, constantly. Quite seriously, this industry moves so fast it's a matter of keeping an ear to the ground, speaking to as many people as possible, following things like Twitter and Reddit, finding podcasts from people who you respect and listening to those. If you want to start, however, go back to basics. Read the Satoshi white paper, read the Nick Sabo white papers on smart contracts, read the Ethereum white paper. Look at what's going on when there's a discussion around new technologies that supposedly improve on different protocols. Don't just read the media release. Mm -hmm. Look at what else is around there. Look at what other people are saying. If you want to stay up to date, find the people who you value and follow them on Twitter. But also don't, and this probably sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but don't follow the hype. Try to look beyond that and make your own assessment. Mm -hmm. Because like the media releases for the really teeny tiny POC, it sounds amazing, sounds like they're going to save the world. But it won't necessarily, at least that thing may not. But it doesn't mean to say that there's not something else happening behind the scenes, mm -hmm. which is far more powerful and far more valuable. So 
keep your ear to the ground, speak to people, listen to people, do your own research. And be willing to learn and change your own assumptions. I mean, to be honest, when I first got into it and first heard about Bitcoin, I did think that it was all Silk Road related. <laughs> and then I started to speak to people in the industry and I realized that that's not what it's about at all. And it's much more interesting and much more powerful than that. And that's, you know what, I'm glad that's gone or going, yeah, leaving the industry because that's not, that's not what it's about. The other thing is to make sure that you understand fundamental differences. For instance, different blockchains are different computing protocols. Certain myths around blockchain or Bitcoin, like the fact that Bitcoin's all Silk Road, should be challenged and are not true. And the other thing is the concept of um, complete interoperability between blockchains. Know where we're at and where we're going. Because are all blockchains interoperable now? No. Might there be in the future? Possibly. Is that something people are working on? Definitely. And also look at what's going on around the world because this is global. This isn't just Australia or the US or China. Um, even legally, I mean, we know that in any other example, so normal anti-money laundering laws or the regulators speak to one another, why wouldn't they be in any other aspect of the law? Why wouldn't, the, why wouldn't the people who are developing this work internationally either? It just makes sense. So keep an ear to the ground, speak to people, and be willing to challenge your own biases and your own assumptions. And for my ad, have fun while at it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. It's actually pretty cool. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Hannah. You're welcome. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> that was Hannah Glass. There's some food for thought there, huh? Since we met for this interview, um, Hannah has been promoted to senior associate at her firm. Uh, please join me in congratulating Hannah. We were all pulling for you. It's well deserved. Uh, you can get in touch with her on both Twitter at Hannah underscore Glass and LinkedIn. And I'll add the link to that on the show notes. Uh, let her know you heard her here. Ask her any questions you might have, uh, get in touch. You can also reach me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, the details also on the show notes. Feel free to send me guest suggestions, feedback, questions for shows, uh, something that you would like to see if there's a topic, uh, a certain profession that you'd like me to cover. Just let me know there. Uh, I love for you to, to get in touch. You can also email me at blockchainpp at gmail.com. And episode six, it's coming up next week as I have been a little bit cheeky with postings because I'm traveling and I didn't have internet last week, so I couldn't really deal with uh, uploading uh, large files online. But I think I'm back on track now. And next week, uh, we'll hear from Mitch Travers, who is the community manager for Brown Tech. Um, hope you have a good week, and I'll see you at the next block. Bye.